Um, maybe just to start, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with GavCal. Uh, so GavCal is probably best known for the research uh, product that they, they write uh, in terms of the macro. Uh, maybe our team in uh, China with Dragonomics. I'm sure many of you have met Charles and uh, Louis Gav or maybe Anatole Koleski. Uh, I actually, I joined about uh, just over four years ago um, to uh, join the capital side to launch what we call the Asian Value Fund. Uh, this is a very straightforward fund. We invested in about 30 to 35 names across Asia X Japan, uh, primarily on a bottom-up basis. Uh, we don't do any hedging, no, we don't do any currency hedging, no futures, no shorting. Uh, it's just very straightforward stock picking. Um, maybe just before I start, um, I just want to discuss, you know, what do I believe? And this is a very basic uh, uh, table here. So like many of you, I'm a fundamental investor. Uh, I believe in valuation. I believe that fundamentals and valuation together drive uh, uh, share prices over the very long term. One other thing I'd like to note, and, and I'm going to say this now because it, it comes into play with some of my ideas, is that I also believe that um, in the short term, you have what you call, what I call relative change in expectations. So uh, if there's you know, macro or sentiment or changes in the outlook for a company, you might have a company that is very cheap, but if the outlook begins to look a little worse, it can get a bit cheaper. Uh, and so I try to manage for that. But uh, over the long term, we're really looking for the companies that uh, have strong fundamentals uh, at a good valuation um, over the long term. Um, where do we hunt for value? So the, I, I find every time that I talk to people, the word value seems to mean different things to different people. So uh, for me, uh, the way I think about it is uh, PEs and, P and price to book ratios are very important multiples to help indicate value. Um, but to me, a, a simply a low PE and a low price to book is not the, most, uh, the best indicator of value. What I'm really trying to do is, is to find companies that are trading at a significant discount to what I call the economic productivity. So in that case, at least in uh, where, I, where I'm looking for my investment opportunities in Asia X Japan, what we do is we look at uh, primarily quality names that are trading at uh, attractive valuations. And the reason for that is uh, very simple. Companies with a competitive advantage that's sustainable will have um, a very good uh, profitability, higher returns than their peers that can be compounded over long periods of time, and they tend to outperform. Now, uh, that, and that tends to be about 75% of the portfolio, just very roughly. Now, about 25% of the portfolio, I will also invest in what I call deep value, which is more of a traditional way of looking at value. Um, the reason that, that I really like some of the deep value ideas, obviously, is that uh, they have very good risk-reward characteristics. You know, very little downside, maybe a lot of upside. So the real risks here are that you find yourself in a value trap, or you find that you don't have the patience to wait for it to play out. Um, one reason I don't do a 100% deep value portfolio in Asia is that I just find that it's very difficult to find a lot of, or, or a, a decent number of these good ideas. And I think part of the reason is, and, and people may argue with me, but in my personal experience is that if you find companies in Asia that have very great asset value that's not reflected in the share price, you just don't have the legal framework uh, to enforce those companies to make a change. I think we've seen a lot of activists and shareholders uh, uh, come to Asia, uh, especially from the United States, and really fail to be able to push those things through. I also think that there's a cultural issue where you have a lot of companies that are family owned, uh, and their view is that it's not just about getting the share price up, it's a source of their comfort, their, you know, kind of their power. They don't need to make these changes, uh, and they certainly don't need you to tell them to do it. Uh, one other opportunity I think that's growing in Asia is dividends. Um, we've seen a lot of companies with very great balance sheets, uh, very low payout ratios, huge cash flows, capex have been down. So I think over the longer term, you're really going to see a huge opportunity. Uh, it just may take time. I'm going to skip this, uh, this slide. Now, uh, given uh, the kind of uh, declines that we've seen in Asia X Japan, I just added this slide because I just wanted to talk about um, um, you know, what do I think about the Asian markets? Now, it's not, it's not really my business to sit around and, and try to figure out where the bottom is in the market or where the top's going to be. But I do think it's important to have some kind of framework to think about it, uh, especially in this situation as we have today where you're seeing a lot of babies thrown out with the bathwater. So we want to be able to think about, you know, can we even see the floor? 
And so what I've done here is, is just in very simple terms, because I also believe in the short term, uh, when things are looking ugly, people like to anchor themselves in something that's very simple to understand, and that's the, what I think is the 12-month uh, forward PE ratio for the MSCI Asia X Japan Index. So as of around today, we're below 11, per, uh, 11 times earnings. The average over this uh, time period has been about 13. Now the point here is, is that if you take a look at this chart, the bottom has really been just below 10. And every time it's gotten there, it's only stayed there for a short period of time. The other time it went much lower was during the uh, global financial crisis. And I would argue that um, even though things don't look rosy today, we're not facing uh, this kind of crisis, especially in Asia. Um, now the bottom chart here is just simply to add that the earnings number that we're using for that PE is also one that's come down. So earnings revision ratios have come off for a good part of this year. Uh, there's definitely potential for it to come off some more depending on uh, how the trade war escalates. Um, but I do think that we're at least in a position where we're beginning to see the floor. And if you're a stock picker in that environment, you should really sharpening your pencils to look for, for things that can be good buys over the long term. And, and lastly, I just want to add one other thing. Uh, Citigroup did a very interesting uh, and very simple um, analysis of where the market is by looking at the last 29 years of this index on a price-to-book basis. And in the last 29 years, there have been 29 corrections of 10% or more. Every time that there's been one of those corrections, uh, well, I'm sorry, the average and the median uh, floor for those corrections has been 1.6 times. We're now at about 1.5. The previous, t prior to that, uh, the lowest was 0.9 in the Asian financial crisis. In 01, we got to about 1.2, 1.3, and that was during a period when we had a recession, SARS, terrorist attacks, um, uh, you know, lots of bad stuff. And in, then, again, the global financial crisis. And so if we're at 0.5, you know, could we get down to you know, 0.3 or 0.2? It's possible. But then the question I would ask you is, do we really, are we really facing a crisis? Maybe, maybe things are slowing down or maybe things are not looking that great. But I, I don't think that we have a, 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 like the developed market debt crisis we had in 08. We don't have the mismatch in currencies uh, in debt that we saw in, 08, uh, in 97, 98. Uh, so I think that we're, I, I think that, you know, we're really getting towards a, towards something, uh, towards a, towards a floor. Now, I want to talk about SK Hynex for one of my ideas, and uh, you, uh, you know, it's funny because uh, two of the prior speakers have talked about Samsung Electronics, and one of the key parts of this is memory. So, you know, the, the bad thing is I hope that I don't bore you by talking about this, but I'm hoping that I also provide a different perspective on how to think about some of the, some of the issues around memory and the valuation. The, uh, the negative part is that if three of us are talking about memory, I'm worried that it's become consensus. <laughs> So one of the things that I'd like to mention here is that uh, the demand for semiconductors in memory has, is really changing. So if you look back at the, the long history, for a long time, the only thing that drove it was PC demand. It was a single product that had uh, very clear cycles, often driven by uh, uh, software changes like Microsoft uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Office and things like that. And then and when the iPhone was uh, launched uh, just uh, almost you know, over 10 years ago, you had smartphones become the next driver. And, and that added a, a, another element of cyclicality to this business. And if you look at all these other lines that I've added there, what you'll see is that that is really the new demand that, we're that we, we should be seeing, uh, whether it's the demand's going to come from autonomous driving, uh, hyperscale computing, uh, the, uh, the Internet of Things, uh, there's just lots of things that we're going to see. And the important part is not only is demand going to go up, as has been stated before, but I think the other important part is that you're going to see multiple sources of new demand that have long product cycles, short product cycles, and when you put that all together, that means that the demand for memory, the cyclicality, should be more muted. And with most cyclicals, you know, the reason that they get these low multiples is because of the volatility in earnings. I would argue that going forward, you're really going to begin to see that be more muted. Uh, and there are other reasons why I also see these companies be more profitable. The valuation in, in general, I believe, should be re-rated up. Um, again, I think it was a, a, a Kurt that meant, talked about Moore's Law. This is actually very critical to the story. Uh, in the past, you know, Moore's Law was the observation that the number of transistors per square inch on an integrated circuit doubled uh, every year or a little more than that. So you would have a, a four gigabyte chip, 
Uh, when you move to the next technology node, you would have a smaller chip at eight gigabytes, so you'd have something that was cheaper to make uh, and had uh, and actually doubled the so-called supply of memory. But the problem is, is that the, the laws of physics are making this much more difficult to continue. So really what you're seeing going forward, and uh, apologies for the uh, ta-da um, uh, typo, that um, really what's gonna happen is you're not gonna be able to get smaller and go to 16, or it's gonna be much harder. You're just gonna need more chips. And so if we go back to the previous chart, you have a lot of demand, but it's gonna become more difficult to supply that demand. Um, I'll just, this is a very, uh, uh, another chart supporting that is that uh, sometimes when you get broke, uh, re a research from brokers or you get an email from them, they'll talk about, oh, you gotta be careful, CapEx has gone up a lot. Uh, supply is gonna increase, th uh, prices are gonna go way down, margins are gonna collapse, it's over. Now what I would argue here is that the issue with, because of Moore's law and the capital intensity of these businesses, even though the CapEx is going up, you're not actually seeing the bid growth increase. So if you look at the line at that top, uh, the, the, the line part of that chart, it's actually, you see 20% growth going forward, but the CapEx is going up a lot. So unlike what you've seen in the past when you had large increases in CapEx and all of a sudden the bit growth went up 50, 40, 80%, we don't think that's gonna happen anymore. And so you have an environment where it's harder to supply, a lot more demand, again, it should be better. However, in the near term, we are seeing what we see in the lower left-hand chart, uh, for instance, with DRAM, DRAM price is coming off. So I think that's really why you've seen Micron come off quite a lot, uh, Hynex has come, has come off, uh, and Samsung's been, has kind of languished a bit, and a lot of this is because people look at the DRAM price, it's coming down, it's a commodity, margins must be coming down, it can't, you know, you shouldn't own it. Uh, let me skip that chart. So when it comes to valuation, uh, a lot of, uh, I, I like to look at things in a lot of different ways to better understand it. And uh, uh, some of the other speakers have talked about DCFs. I, I agree, I really don't like DCFs for determining, determining share price targets or actual value. Um, I have worked at you know, many other, uh, other shops where um, you know, I really hated sitting around talking about DCFs or arguing about the discount rate or having to look at a company that was laden with a lot of debt, had very you know, little uh, margins where you know, if you make tweaked it by 10, uh, the margin by 10 basis points, all of a sudden you had 20% more upside. But what I do like to do is kind of a reverse DCF, which is if I put in assumptions that are just very, very conservative, what is it telling me? And so what I've done here is I said, look, for high necks, let's just assume that this thing never grows again, that actually the margin falls. And I have a relatively high discount rate. Uh, you actually get close to the current share price. You actually even get a little bit of upside. And I think that these assumptions are perfectly absurd when you think about it because of everything that I've mentioned previously. Another way to look at this is in terms, of, especially even the recent share price action is, if you look at the top uh, graph, uh, you see the share price versus the gross profit margin. Uh, it's amazing how uh, all these memory names, also Micron included, the share price will go up when the gross margin goes up and come off when it comes down. So we've had really amazing gross profit margins uh, for uh, um, Hynex uh, since uh, the end of last year and actually going into the first half of this year. But you've seen the share price languish because people look at it as peak. And that's why, you know, when you look at the company right now, it's trading at about 3.2 uh, times forward earnings. To me, that's a typical, that's a, that would be considered an expensive price for a very deep cyclical. Um, having said that, I think that, you know, again, going back to what we talked about before, going forward, the margin uh, in the next down part of the cycle I think is very likely or very possible to be actually equal, if not higher, than the last peak. And I'll go into some reasons why that's the case, uh, largely to do with uh, industry consolidation combined with demand. So I think that um, in the near term, to be honest, I own this stock in size starting back in mid-2016 up until about the beginning of this year. I don't own it at the moment, uh, largely because of the, 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 the decline in the DRAM prices, and then you combine what's happening in terms of tech in general. I think that uh, you know, as, an, as a value investor, you believe uh, by definition in inefficient markets. Uh, so just as stocks get overbought, uh, I think there's a very good chance it gets oversold. For instance, when I bought it in mid-2016, the stock had a uh, over 10% operating profit margin, no debt, uh, there had been almost no capacity, uh, no capacity investment uh, for three years in the industry, but there's still very steady demand for DRAM, and it was trading at 0.8 times book. 
So to me, that made no sense, and it's one of the reasons why I bought so much of it. I, again, you know, and I'll show you later, where the valuation is today on a price-to-book basis also doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, just adding in terms of consolidation, uh, the interesting thing is that the top three companies uh, have actually increased their total market share from 65 to 95%. And I'm willing to bet that this day, it stays this way for a very long time, uh, just because of the, unless we have a complete change in technology, this is going to stay this way because of uh, the capital intensity. Uh, and also, you know, making DRAM is not, uh, as a previous speaker said, it's not simple. Like, you don't just go to the store, spend a few billion dollars, buy the machinery, set up shop, and start making it. Uh, the Chinese would like to do that. Um, you know, we have some colleagues who've gone to China, and they said, you know, don't worry about us for 10 years, because it's not that easy. Uh, the, I think Hynix is interesting. Uh, I mean, I like Samsung Electronics. Uh, I just think Hynix might be uh, maybe a slightly cleaner story because it's really all about memory. And, and again, they, they have very strong uh, market share gains. And, and, and. Um, here, another look at the valuation. So the top chart here is the PE uh, and the price to book. So if you look at the red line, that's the 12-month uh, 12 price to book. And it's, it's at, it just below one. Uh, the PE, is, as I mentioned before, is at uh, 3.2. Now, we look at the return on equity. Now, maybe that's a peak return on equity at over 30%. But if, again, looking back to what I've mentioned before, I really don't see how that, that number goes back down to previous lows, because we just don't have the capacity uh, increases that, that are needed to see that uh, change in supply and demand. And also, we know that demand is going to be increasing. Um, so the other things I might mention about Hynix is that just in terms of valuation, uh, it has, uh, again, no debt. Uh, if you like EV to EBITDA multiples, it's at about 1.6 times. Um, I think that uh, one of the risks with this company is that it is Korean. It is part of the SK group. Uh, for those who you have invested in Korea over the long term, uh, you know, one of the issues has always been that, especially with the SK group, is that they're not necessarily the most shareholder-friendly companies. Uh, I used to be, uh, I remember when I was a telecom analyst, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago and talking to SK Telecom, um, you know, they never returned money, even though their, their cash flows were huge. And even I saw them recently, um, I used to say, you know, it's such a simple decision for you to make. You don't need many people in the room to make that decision. Just give all that huge money that you have back to shareholders and you'll, ex you know, you'll feel more love than you've ever experienced and they don't seem to care. <laughs> Um, one other name that I, maybe I'd like to just throw out there, and this is one, that, uh, again, that um, I think is more about putting it on the radar screen, is Geely Automobiles, Automobile Holdings. So uh, many of you might be familiar with this name. It is the le uh, leading domestic brand in China in terms of automobile production. Um, generally speaking, their products are uh, kind of more mainstream. The pricing is below some of the, the products made by the joint ventures, you know, from BMW and Mercedes. Uh, and so there's uh, been a very strong growth story to this stock, especially last year when it was one of the leading uh, performers in the, in the, amongst the Chinese names listed in Hong Kong. Um, and part of the problem with the stock right now is that you, it's come off about 50% since the peak. And it's caught in this uh, a kind of terrible situation where um, it's one of the worst performers now because everyone is very scared about uh, the, you know, the impact of the delivering process in the financial system in China on consumption, the uh, impact of the trade war, um, and actually what it's and also because the year-over-year -year numbers are very difficult to, to beat because they had some tax incentives, there were some incentives to purchase these cars last year. And so what you've ended up with, if you look at the top chart, is uh, you know, double-digit declines in passenger vehicle sales. This is for the industry. And that, those are some pretty bad numbers, and most people don't expect it to recover immediately. My view on this is that, uh, sure, Maybe the numbers are coming off, but I don't think this is a structural decline in the demand for uh, cars, and especially not for Geely. Uh, so, uh, and the reason for that is, you know, not, not to be too cliche about the long-term potential in China, but, um, you know, if you take a look at the per capita, uh, um, um, the per capita uh, uh, penetration of cars in, in China, it's still very, very low compared to other emerging markets. Uh, and, and even in this weak market, you've seen Geely is one of the biggest market share gainers amongst everyone. 
Uh, again, what we did is we just did the DCF uh, process here. Um, I just took the, co the consensus numbers, and uh, they're probably too high, because if I put those in there, I get massive, massive upside, because this is actually one of the most profitable automobile uh, manufacturers in the world. Uh, and then what I did here is I said, well, let's, let's just cut everything by 50%. Uh, we have a pretty high uh, discount rate. Uh, then we start getting closer to something that's like the share price. So as, this, as expectations fall, as the share price falls and begins to imply lower expectations, I think this stock can look very interesting. Uh, and then from, a, uh, from more traditional metrics on a PE basis, it's fallen uh, below eight. Uh, yet, you know, we have a company here that has our ROE above 30%. Um, when you do the DuPont model, which is one of my favorite uh, ways of looking at stocks, because I feel like if you really believe that, that the return profile of a company is what's going to drive the valuation, uh, you can tie every element of a DuPont model to something fundamental in what the company is doing. And the thing about this ROE is that it's not due to leverage, because this company has a 50% net cash to equity position, uh, and it's not due to asset turns. Um, it's really because they have a 12% net profit uh, margin. Uh, and I know my, my time is, is up, but uh, you know, the other thing I like to add is that this is a, you know, uh, when it comes to autos, usually it's about product launches. They have multiple new product launches. They have uh, launches coming from their joint venture with Volvo. Um, a lot, all of these cars are on the same platform, so you're going to have a lot of operating leverage, uh, whether it's the um, internal combustion cars or their new energy vehicles because uh, they also, there's a requirement in China that if you're making internal combustion engine cars, you have to have a certain amount of sales of new energy vehicles. All of this is on the same platform, uh, so you're going to see a lot of operating leverage. Uh, they, they have a 5% dividend yield and it, well, on a 30% payout ratio. Uh, again, you know, we know the net debt to equity is great. Uh, the free cash flow yield is uh, you know, also in the mid-single digits. So I think that um, as you know, the hysterics continue in China. If this stock continues to fall, um, you, you know, really is one to, stick, to put on the radar screen. So I think that's it. So I hope I uh, didn't take up too much time, but um, those are my thoughts. Thank you very much, Gavin. Uh, are there any questions from the room? Yes. US uh, car companies in the next uh, five to ten years? Um, so I, I think that, well, I think a lot of it's going to really depend on how this trade war develops, right? So we've already seen BMW get a sweetheart deal uh, with China through their JV with uh, uh, the LISCO, uh, the local joint venture brilliance. Um, but I would say that in very basic terms, what you a lot of the foreign cars, especially whether it's Mercedes or BMW, they tend to be more expensive, premium cars. And so the, the, the absolute numbers that they sell is, is still not very big. And so for the domestic brands like Geely, there's a real opportunity for them to get more mid-price products. And also for companies like Geely, uh, it's easier for them to expand their networks. Um, they are, they're totally local. They understand the people around them. I mean, the whole reason some of these joint ventures happened is because uh, they don't know how to get the, uh, the manufacturing facilities up. They don't know how to set up the dealerships. They don't know how to deal with the local, lo you know, each local government in every province. So I think that um, companies like Geely are well positioned to, to do very well in that mid-price segment. Uh, and especially as, they, as, as the scale grows and, and, they're, and, and they grow faster than everyone else, you're going to see a lot of these smaller players uh, in, the, in China drop out. Um, but I think that there's room for both. I just think that uh, they're going to occupy different parts of the market. Any other questions? I'm aware of a class action against some, uh, Samsung, Hynix, and Micron for pushing up the prices. Can that have an impact on pricing for Hynix as well as for Samsung? So my, if I understand it correctly, that, that class action suit is from China, right? I know that, is, is, okay. But I know that the Chinese have done something very similar. Um, you know, my, my question for that is what do you do? I mean, what are you gonna do? You gonna, you gonna regulate the industry? These people have, the, tech, the, the reason that they're in that position is because they have technology. And it's not like anyone can do anything about it, right? You're not gonna nationalize their facilities. 
Um, I mean, there are other companies that are in that situation. Uh, you know, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Taiwan Semiconductor. I mean, they are light years ahead of everybody else. It's almost scary, right? You know, someone could sue them, but I, I don't know what you're going to do because no one else is going to be able to, to, you know, go to five nanometers, right? Nobody. I mean, Samsung is having a hard time. Intel's almost giving up. So uh, I think that ultimately I think that it's, it's probably a negotiating tactic for something, but I don't think that there's a real resolution to it. Any other questions? I've got one uh, related to this. So the, it seems that uh, all the DRAM memory comes from uh, Korea, or at least two thirds of uh, the world supply, um, and this indeed would would cause some worries from the from the buyers. Um, is the whole value chain uh, is it uh, in Korea? So you were talking about you, you cannot just go buy machines and start making DRAM. Uh, where can you buy uh, machines uh, uh, if you would like to do that? So are there com key components to this uh, product uh, that are not in Korea, so to, to, to speak? I, I should know the answer to that better, but um, you know, I think it's a process of, uh, of a variety of different uh, equipment suppliers, uh, probably mostly from Japan. And also, when you, and also for companies like Samsung, as you're probably familiar, they have a lot of companies that are captive suppliers to them. Uh, some of which I've you know, never looked at or maybe not be listed, where they only make things for Samsung. Um, so uh, I can name a few companies where there's always been the hope that these companies would be able to provide equipment to other manufacturers, especially in China, um, but it never really seems to happen. So I think, again, I think it's, very, it's, it's still very, very difficult. Another, another question? Okay, Gavin, then uh, I would like to thank you. Thank you.